Hello everyone, Stephen Zuckerman in Baton Rouge and continuing down our journey of the nervous system we're going to uh, look at the long tracks of the spinal cord and various spinal cord syndromes. So here is a cross section through a spinal cord and the important things to notice are that the descending tracks are depicted in red whereas the ascending ones are blue. And amongst the descending tracts, the lateral corticospinal tract is uh, the most important clinically. And amongst the ascending tracts, the lateral spinal thalamic tract and the posterior columns consisting of the um, gracilis, which is more medial, and cuneatus is more lateral, are the ones to concentrate on. This slide shows how the information which carries pain and temperature has its first order of neuron in the dorsal root ganglia and it sends its axonal projection into the spinal cord into the substantia gelatinosa and there it makes a synapse so that the second order neuron makes a cross anterior to the gray matter of the spinal cord to then ultimately ascend in the lateral spinal thalamic tract. This slide emphasizes how modalities of vibratory and joint position sense are transmitted into the nervous system, again with their cell bodies in the dorsal ganglia but with their axonic projections going up the two posterior column tracks and they don't make any synapses until they reach the brain stem at the nuclei for the, both the gracilis and cuneatus. Out of uh, academic interest, I threw this slide in depicting the topographical representation in the different ascending sensory tracks regarding where in the body the uh, sensations distributed within those tracts, not that this information really has any great clinical application. And continuing on in probably what doesn't have any great clinical application here is a depiction of the gray matter of the spinal cord and you can see depicted the location of the anterior horn cells and also make note of the intermedial lateral nucleus which actually controls the autonomic nervous system functions. In regards to vascular supply to the spinal cord, the anterior two-thirds of the cord are supplied by the anterior spinal artery, whereas the posterior spinal artery only covers about one-third of the spinal cord. This slide gives a better overview of the entire pathways of both the posterior column and the spinal thalamic tracts. The posterior column modalities are depicted on the left and you can see that there have three neurons involved in the pathway. The first in the dorsal root ganglia which then synapses at the level of the medulla and continues on in the medial lemniscus and finally to the VPL, ventral posterior lateral nucleus of the thalamus to the primary somatosensory cortex, as opposed to the three neuron pathway of the spinal thalamic tract, where the second one um, starts in the uh, posterior horn of the gray matter, crosses over and then a synapses and the third neuron uh, starts from the VPL of the thalamus going again to the sensory cortex. This is the same exact slide but if it works it will have an amazing animation showing the uh, three different neurons with their connections and making everything crystal clear and memorable for a lifetime. Besides a complete 
cord transection, which obviously causes complete lack of sensation of all modalities as well as a complete paralysis below the level of the lesion. There are three not uncommon partial spinal cord syndromes. Those are the anterior cord syndrome, central cord syndrome, and brown sequard syndromes. A stroke of the spinal cord can take place if there's any injury or vascular insufficiency involving the anterior spinal artery. And as you can see from this slide, certainly the spinal thalamic tracts are going to be involved. The alpha motor neurons at that level are going to be involved as well. And if uh, there is more involvement, there will be also be involvement variably of the lateral spinal cord, the corticospinal tract. As a result of the distribution of an anterior spinal artery lesion, there will be a flaccid areflexia with complete paralysis below the level of the lesion. Again, there will be bilateral spinal thalamic tract involvement, but there would be complete preservation of vibratory and joint position sense. In addition, there would uh, likely be autonomic disturbances such as hypotension with uh, possible bladder and bowel dysfunction as well as uh, urinary retention. The so-called central cord syndrome affects the cervical spine and is the result of either trauma or perhaps a syrinx in which the central portion of the spinal cord has the lesion and therefore the crossing spinal thalamic fibers are affected and depending on the size of the central lesion there is variable involvement of the intermediate lateral column so therefore autonomic dysfunction and also variable lateral uh, corticospinal tract involvement but in general one sees greater motor disturbance involving the upper extremities than in the lower extremities. And finally, we have the favorite of the uh, board questions, and that is the brown sequard syndrome or a cord hemisection, which, as you can see here, would involve ipsilateral dorsal column function and ipsilateral corticospinal tract, but affect the pain and temperature sense of the other side of the body due to the fact that the spinal thalamic fibers have crossed over, and so you'll have this alternating hemianesthesia in which there will be involvement of posterior column modalities on one side and spinothalamic modalities on the opposite side.